we're going to talk about uh, Lean Startup and Agile methodologies. We're very lucky to have together with us Mr. Adonis Liberatos, that is an assistant professor at the Department of Business Administration at the National Capodistro University of Athens. And we also have Mr. Kostadinos Anatopoulos, that he's the head of CSR Activities and Strategy Consulting at Accenture. We are organizing this, um, this event through our Inaugura platform. Inaugura is a matchmaking platform that HDB has created for enterprises in order for them to connect with uh, investors and other potential business partners. So in case you have not already uh, created a profile, we're going to leave a link at the end of the webinar for you to create it. And during, uh, having this platform, we are uh, having, we're hosting different type of events. One of those is the webinars that we're having at the moment. And we're going to try to address different hot topics from the, from the market in order to make it easy for enterprises to, to keep up with all the trends and to answer any questions that you might potentially have. And at the same time, we are hosting different type of pitching events every two and a half or three months, more or less. And we are making all these announcements on our website, on uh, inaugura.gr and on our, our, on our social media. So in case you want to attend or participate in any other of the events, please, you can just um, become a member or you can follow our, our channels, our media channels in order to get informed. That being said, I would like to already uh, welcome Mr. Liberatos, and then uh, whenever you're ready, we may start with your part of the presentation. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. Can you? Yep, we can. Okay, thank you, everyone. I, my name is Antonis Liberatos. I'm assistant professor of the newly established Department of Business Administration at the National Nicaragua University of Athens. I teach business strategy, innovation and, and entrepreneurship. And I'm also wearing a second hat in the framework of uh, our university. I'm in charge of Archimedes Center, which is the technology transfer office of the university and the uh, uh, business accelerator. So uh, today's topic is Lean Startup. I know that some of you are executive in existing firms or are running uh, SMEs, uh, having different backgrounds. Um, it's important to know that despite the fact that Lean Startup is, of course, a methodology for startups, which is dominant the last 10 years, it's more and more used. Uh, some, some of the features of, the, of this methodology are also used for new product development, also for existing startups. So uh, first thing first, uh, as this was uh, a methodology for um, startups and early stage um, ideas looking to become a venture, they, the, the founders, let's say, of these tools and these methodologies thought that there is, a, there is something, a problem, there is something missing. And is uh, the fact that the classic approach on the way we, we uh, taught uh, entrepreneurship, on the way we coach entrepreneurship was uh, that you have a good idea, you need to know everything uh, as much as possible, keep it secret and start executing a very well um, written business plan. This has an underlying assumption, which is that startups are smaller version of large companies so that you can start from a very early stage to uh, writing and drafting a business plan. However, this has two fundamental problems. The one is that uh, having in mind that this is an early stage, you have a, a chain of, of assumptions that don't necessarily uh, fit all together at this stage because you don't know things and you assume things and actually having a business planning make it work as predicted is is it's quite difficult the second uh, problem because you have a number of assumptions that are interlinked among them the second uh, the second problem with this approach is that you actually prescribe on how the new product should be so in in other words you actually have in terms of software, for example, you have all the features of the software and after having found the, the money for starting the business, you start writing code. 
However, uh, as Eric Ries says, one of the one of the founding fathers of this methodology, the largest source of, of waste is often um, products that that do not really respond to problems. So, going from the classic approach to lean startup. Um, sorry, that are my slides. Have a problem with the slides. Yes, now. So the aim of all this approach is start interacting from a very early stage with potential class customers in order to have to have the verification of a few or a number or all, all of the assumptions that you have on an early stage. So two of the main tools you is the idea that you discover yet yeah, that you de develop first a business model before developing a business plan. And then you develop a minimum viable product, which is a technique that we're going to talk about before going into new product development. So this is the overall idea that from an idea we uh, we go uh, to a minimum viable product till we go to the final product. And this is the general idea on how you proceed from the idea to the market. As I will also explain at the end, this is this looks very linear and very nice. However, in, in real life, this is not so linear, not so nice. And there are very feedback loops and interactions among this, the several steps. So for pedagogic reasons, in order to explain it, we need to have something like that, to present you something like that. And how, at the end, we'll explain you how this is not possible to do it exactly as it seems. So the first the first part is that you need to form a founding team and it looks like more than 90% of all the teams from the idea till they develop the till they start a company it takes them uh, 6 to uh, to 18 months so especially if going through the lean startup startup process it's very much likely that you have a lot of work to do before starting a business. So uh, you need actually a startup teams looks more like that. You don't have much space and you really have to uh, collaborate uh, with the other. Uh, another important issue for in the day of uh, early stage startup is, is that you some people say that this is not uh, this is not a profession. This is uh, this is a bipolar disease. Uh, that you often feel happy and sad six or seven times within the same day. So really you have to have the nerves to, to undergo through all that. What we think that uh, teams need to have is at least two of the following three features, namely expertise in a, in a field, passion or opportunity. So you need to find your own sweet spot on how many of those elements do you have as a team. I'm not going very much into this team. It's, it's a large topic, and uh, but it, it is a basis. It is a basis because what I would like to mention is that when you start doing all the rest, you have to have what we called, I will I will use a Greek proverb, which is namely you don't have an English proverb like that, you have a Latin proverb like, like that, which for those of you not speaking Greek means good relationships come from good agreements. So in order to go into this adventure, you need to know from the beginning what I'm expecting at the end of the railroad. 30% of the shares, 50% of the shares, or 70% of the shares. I know that sometimes this is awkward to have this conversation uh, on an early stage, but if you don't do it from an early stage, imagine how awkward it will be in six or ten months when you have invested time, money and effort eventually on this venture. So the second stage in this in this process is to define the problem, set the hypothesis and generate the business model. What I'm calling you to, to do from an early stage is to steal like an artist, because we think that just like in art, entrepreneurship, there is no real new thing that everything is new. So there are many things out, out there and people that uh, propose a pricing model, a business model, have gone through several trial and error um, procedures and eventually it 
it is worth it to uh, to have some some of the feet, uh, some of these features. Uh, eventually, the most a very good example is one of the most successful application was uh, Barclays application in the UK, where for the user interface, I'm not going into details of what this was, for the user interface, they used exactly the same elements as the Domino's Pizza um, elements. Why? Because everyone in the UK knew how this worked, so it was very familiar also for the clients of the bank having an application that gives very different information than those provided by a Domino's Pizza application, but the user interface was so familiar that it really provided uh, great help to, uh, to Barclays to succeed and have a, one of the most successful application in uh, application, fintech applications in the UK. So go out there and start searching what the others are doing and not necessarily only the competitors. The second step is you have to define your problem. You have to see products as solutions to problems. And if you do so, you're actually try to define the magnitude of the problem by defining use cases that you can later generalize and give relative numbers. Use cases is trying to imagine persons that later will be your clients what what are the states of mind? What are the problems? What they live every day and what are their frustrations? So this later you can generalize it in order to proceed and and go come closer to the, uh, to your uh, clients. Moreover, as you have a use case, like for example, I have an executive working in a, in a bank in a, in a very particular in risk management or something, start giving related numbers. How many of those departments do we have in Greece? How many employees have those departments in Greece? Giving related numbers will give you a later a very, a very big help analyzing the market. So having defined the problem and not the solution, Many, many say, OK, and what's the problem that eFood was solving? My answer would be that eFood had early adopters, people doing this. This requires effort and it does not necessarily give all the information that you have in eFood because menus change, uh, shops are going down, uh, you have uh, changes of prices. You're so have in mind that for every new product, there are the so-called early adopters. Those customers that for them, the, the problem is bigger, more important and more, um, more urgent. So if someone, some, a, a person like that did an effort, if I can get rid of this effort of this per, uh, person, I've solved him a problem and I have an early adopter as a client. So having defined a problem, the next step uh, suggested is my, make a competitive analysis, but in a sense that not searching for people or organization doing the same things as I do, but all searching for direct and indirect competition, namely uh, organizations, companies and people that solve the same problems. These are your actual, um, your actual competitors. And sometimes uh, the competition comes from what we called from solutions that um, what we call home, homegrown solutions. These are, let me give you an example. The biggest competitor of a small com of our software company providing an ERP for SMEs is Excel. Why? Because for a, for a small entrepreneur, this is a way of doing things and this is cheap, he knows it and he doesn't have to pay anything. So in order to sell to, uh, to someone running a small company of two or three people, you have to convince him to unlearn Excel, to learn your tool and pay 5, 10 or 15 euros per month. You can imagine that this is hard. So have also in mind that competition may come from what we call homegrown solution. 
The next th thing that we can do, and this is the last part that we do actually in our office, is what we call a business model canvas. Um, not going into much detail on that, you can find a lot of that and a lot of examples. Just uh, I would like to tell you that a business model canvas at an early stage is a bunch of hypotheses that I need to go out. I need to go it out of the building and assuming on based on this hypothesis, make experiments. I will explain you later. I will give you examples and to see if these hypotheses are valid. So the first thing that I have to do is I at this point on the on the top of the right, I have defined my different target groups. The beachhead market technique is actually a way of selecting the first target group to do my experiments. Um, little story, beachhead market actually comes from the military. Beachhead market is actually the beach that the army um, selects to invade a country. So metaphorically, this is actually your target group that you uh, select to invade your uh, your market. And how you do that? Having having six criteria. Do I have access on this target group? Do they have a purchasing power? How big is the problem? Can you deliver? How big is competition for this target group? Can this target group leverage to new segments? So you actually check all the target groups to those six criteria. Once you've done that, nine, if I can, maybe more than 95% um, of the times, it is clear from where to start. Having also in mind that access is very important. Eventually have a great target group, which is um, Japanese teenagers uh, from Tokyo. This might be great, but this, they might be very long away from, from where I'm doing and, and what I'm doing. So I cannot, really, um, I cannot really have access to them. So at this point of time, eventually this is not a tar good target group for me. So I've selected a target group with this technique. So the next thing is to go to this target group and verify the pro that the problem exists. I cannot go into very much detail on this technique. The main idea is that I'm start talking to people and start asking them if they have the problem that I think they have. I'm not mentioning anything about the solution, um, uh, my solution. I'm just trying to verify that there is a problem. Um, Later stage, when I start talking to people, uh, it is very obvious that that you have patterns coming in, and people start saying from the same target group, "Yes, that this is not a big problem for me because I'm solving it that way," or "Yes, it is a problem, but I don't have the money to solve it," or you can hear several things, or you can hear something like, "Yes, this is a problem." but it goes also hand in hand with another problem that you never thought of it. So if most of the answers are no problem, latent problem or passive problem, most probably there's no market for you. In order to go out and sell as a startup, you need to have um, customers that have an active and urgent problem or a vision. They're doing something for this problem you have as startups the credibility of newness. Namely, you don't have the, the time, you don't have the credibility, you don't have the money to educate your clients that they have a problem and that you're going to solve the problem. Eventually, and I'm saying eventually, Google has the time, the money, and the brand name to convince us that we should wear Google glasses. And even Google did not achieve that. And it will be most unlikely if Google cannot succeed that, that we cannot. So we're actually 
need to head towards urgent problems. So having recognized that our target group has an active urgent problem or what we call the vision is very important. Why? Because this is the number one fail for startups that they're actually building products that they don't solve real. Uh, they're building products that they don't solve real problems. So having verified the problem, the next part is test my solution. And here we we use a technique which is called minimum viable product, where I'm making prototypes that are so minimum that you're actually spend a minimum time, effort and money, but at the same time, they are so good that enable feedback from potential customers. There are numerous examples of minimum viable products. I will tell you this one, which eventually is the most successful, given the results I say, is the most successful minimum viable products of all time. And this is the minimum viable product of Airbnb. These were three friends living in two friends initially, and then later a third one. Uh, living in San Francisco, have in mind that San Francisco is a very, very expensive city. And they found out that there is a design congress coming to San Francisco. They found out the 300 emails of the person going to the conference and they sent them an email saying actually their value proposition, which was we, we, we found out that you come to San Francisco for the conference. Instead of going to an expensive hotel, we suggest to come to our house. Why? Because it will be cheaper, because you're staying with people from San Francisco and we can show you around. And third, because you're staying with people that are going to the same Congress and we have common interests. It's uh, the, the result of the 300 emails was actually three responses. And actually three people went to their house, paid, um, I have no idea the, the price, paid some, uh, paid a price to them and stayed at their house. And they became in the guinea pigs of Airbnb. So actually people asked them, the founders asked them, why did you came here? What, or which out the value proposition was most important? Was it the price? Was it the fact that you're staying with people from San Francisco or was it the fact that we're also going to the Congress? So actually, through minimum viable products, you're doing experiments in order to find out if your hypothesis is real. So why do MVPs and not MVP? Because you don't want to build, 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 build a new product to find out that this is not valid. You want to experiment to find out and through a learning cycle to go further. So having tested the solution is to, uh, the next step is to understand what you've learned and the effects on your business model and to make what we call adjustments or pivots, big changes or small changes to our big, uh, to our business model. The next, the next part is to go and actually write a business plan uh, once you have a valid business model in order to see if this is a valid bu uh, business model. Um, of course, I'm not coming into detail here before incorporating and coming into contracts with early adopters or investors. So actually, um, finishing my uh, small presentation. If there is one message that I can give you for Lean Startup is if it's going, if you're going to fail, it's better to fail fast and cheap and in a way that doesn't kill you. Be why? Because you've not spent one, two or three years and a few hundreds of thousands of, do of dollars or euros to find out that there is no real problem that I'm intending to solve. So I hope this was not too fast. I know it's quite a lot of information. Of course, I'm willing to to answer to any of your questions.
Great, Mr. Liberatos, thank you a lot. Uh, we can have all the questions in the end, I would say. So for, okay. for, for if we have one now, of course, we can address that at the moment. Otherwise, maybe we can we can hear them all at the end. Please, you can take notes um, and then you can either raise your hand or you can write it on the chat. I'm, I'm talking, I'm referring to the audience, of course, in order for our speakers to to address them. So if we have a question now, we can take it. Otherwise, we can. I think we can move on with Mr. Zanotopoulos, and then we can we can address them all. Mr. Zanotopoulos, would you like to take over? Okay. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, my name is Kostakino Zanotopoulos. I'm working in uh, in uh, Accenture, and uh, I'm going to to speak uh, today for uh, business agility and actually not agile methodology, but it will be a little bit the same. I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet, actually. Have you shared it or I can yes. also try? Would you like to answer and share again to see if it's going to work? One moment. I can also share it. Ah. I'll try. Yeah. Now we can see. Yeah, we can see it now. OK. So. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to have a difficult task because uh, Antonis Liberatos is uh, is a professor, so he is he, he's he's an expert in, in explaining things, but uh, I'll try my my best. I would like, of, of course, to, to thank uh, Inoagora and uh, the team to, to invite me. So, what is uh, agility? Let's see. All of us understanding that uh, agility is, is a good thing, but um, to, to, to today's discussion is to, to try to articulate its meaning with more details and uh, also to provoke uh, some thinking on business and also personal context about um, agility. I found uh, um, uh, 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 that we could say agility is a rapid hold body movement with a change of velocity or direction in response to a stimulus and I add or decision. So therefore agility is velocity, speed, change of velocity, speed or direction. So it's, it's a good thing, but uh, in order to, 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 to understand that uh, to change the direction easily and also to have speed, it's, it's like being a, a small uh, free bird flying in, in uh, the blue sky. It's like uh, the proverb in, that we say in Greece, Kalitera plusus ke igis paraftochos ke arostos, better wealth and rich than poor and uh, sick. And the uh, agility is uh, more like a buzz than the, the reality. And in order to emphasize this, I want to tell you that uh, the key of agility is speed. And uh, science has found that uh, speed is a, is a physical characteristic that is uh, one of the few that uh, you cannot radically change. Scouters of uh, soccer teams, when they look for, uh, for talents, they look first at their speed because they know that uh, it's very difficult to, 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 to change it. And uh, all of us remember that when we were, uh, we were uh, uh, children, some uh, of our friends were extremely fast and you can do very little to increase uh, speed so you can in 
increase uh, endurance, you can increase uh, force by um, bodybuilding, by training. The other physical characteristics that uh, you cannot uh, change is uh, IQ. But I will not elaborate on this because uh, I assume that since you are uh, following uh, this uh, afternoon event from Inagora, most of you are very smart. So let's go, let's go back again to, 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 to agility. And uh, so agility, it's uh, speed, but uh, we have to incorporate the world to make a comparison between uh, a power boat and, um, and the super tanker. Do you know how, how long it takes a super tanker, a VLCC, to stop? It takes about 20 minutes, fully loaded VLCC, uh, to stop when traveling at uh, normal speed, 20 minutes. And uh, in emergency situation, they can perform a crash stop, meaning uh, putting the, the engine somehow in reverse and cut the time from 20 minutes to 14 minutes. And actually super tankers turn off their engine 25 kilometers before arriving to, to the ports. So, you also have a picture what is a power boat uh, at um, uh, traveling with a high speed. And, uh, but before you decide which type of boat you would like to, to be, you have to take also into consideration the weather condition. Rough seas, tornadoes, hurricanes, and also calm, sunny waters in, uh, in Greek uh, seas. So you got the message. The, the decision to, to, to be a speedboat or a tanker depends on the, on the situation. And uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, we need the uh, agility because uh, now everything, uh, everything uh, changes. This is the biggest uh, problem. Why agile? Why now? Why? Why? And the, the, the reality is that uh, we understand that everything is, is uh, changing and the speed of changing is due to, 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 to technology. The, 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 the technology and the speed of change is so big that uh, it can uh, transform uh, power boats into super tankers very, 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 very fast. But also the, these uh, changes can uh, produce heavy mega storms that uh, sink uh, the biggest uh, cyclones, uh, that sink the biggest uh, tankers. I would like to, 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 to say now, I would uh, say it uh, later in, in, uh, in my presentation, the story about uh, Airbnb. Andonis uh, showed to you the first email that uh, Airbnb sent to the 300 uh, participants in the San Francisco event. But uh, imagine being Airbnb with uh, thousands of um, of uh, employees, hundreds of thousands of visitors of uh, host during COVID uh, in uh, an amount of time of six weeks, they lost 90% of their business. Imagine 90% of their business. So they have to, to respond uh, very, very fast. This is the um, the agile and uh, the first thing they they did is they changed their refund uh, policy and uh, this created uh, a lot of problems to their uh, host to their to the owners of the um, of the apartments that they are renting through airbnb but it creates a tremendous uh, relief to all the the visitors that uh, they could uh, refund and uh, because they couldn't uh, anymore uh, go to, to 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 the places, and also of course they had to to do a lot of uh, layoffs. They were very clear about the the layoffs. They were close to to the people that they had to to leave, and also 
they change their priorities and uh, they focused on the, their traditional uh, core business and uh, left uh, anything uh, behind. This is the the story of uh, Airbnb. And actually, if you can remember this, that uh, this is a very, very agile response to a, to, to, to a crisis. Of course, I don't want to to elaborate more on the on these factors that uh, why agile you understand everything that uh, we have technology innovation, we have a climate crisis, we have a political shift, we have a, a blaring of the industry, we have n everything that uh, changes um, uh, all uh, all uh, the current world we have seen. Blaring of industry, I want to, 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 to say something, that uh, no one is safe, and uh, I will uh, take also the, the case of the biggest uh, telecom provider here in, uh, in Greece. We all know uh, Cosmote, and now Cosmote, from being a telecom provider, he, they became a, a, a TV uh, uh, provider, they are creating their uh, content, and uh, also they became insurance uh, aggregator, and also they became now a payment institution with uh, PESI. So this uh, blurring of, uh, of um, boundaries between companies is very, very important. Another fact that is also very interesting that the average uh, company lifespan in the S&P 500 from 90 years in 1936 fell to 15 years today. And every two weeks, a company in uh, the uh, S&P 500 is replaced. Every two weeks, we have a new company in, uh, in the S&P uh, 500. So, you need to become agile. And that agility is a management paradox that requires this dual operating uh, mode. It requires the fast fit for purpose, what uh, Airbnb did uh, in order to respond to, 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 to the crisis. But also you have to, to have some slow formal uh, procedure come, uh, which delivers actions. We have to to think that uh, a tanker has to to has a, a, a way of uh, doing things very, very uh, structured. To, to open the light. But what is stopping companies of being agile, since agile is a very good uh, thing? This is a very interesting uh, question. And before before uh, answering these questions, because we are consultants, as I told you, I'm working in Accenture. I have made a, a typo here. We have categorized the companies in four quadrants in terms of their uh, agility. Let's start from first from the chaotic and the inconsistent. And these uh, companies are companies that everything goes, or in Greek, uh, all apesun, open to experimentation, uh, startup mindset, continuous learning. But of course, there is also lack of stability and high risk of failure. And on the other uh, end, we have the plodding alone, with very risk averse, bureaucratic, uh, process oriented, lack of speed, no employee uh, motivation, they are only reacting. We have the at risk, micromanagement, political uh, style of uh, leadership, uh, poor, certainly poor results, risk of survival, and of course, they cannot attract uh, new em employees. And at the other end, we have the truly agile, everything perfect, tapada ola. But again, what is stopping us from being agile? The, 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 the first thing, the risk averse culture. The risk averse culture is that we, we, we don't experiment, we don't uh, learn, we don't want to, to, to be challenged. Another, another uh, uh, very interesting thing Thing for big companies, especially the pride and the myopia. And, and here I would like to, to tell you a story about the Netflix and the blockbuster. 
Blockbuster were the the DVD stores in uh, in US like uh, something like the the video club of uh, of uh, Greece when uh, people they were going taking uh, renting the the DVD and then after a, a week they were uh, going back and uh, and returning and uh, Netflix started by doing this exactly the same business by mail and uh, Blockbuster. Uh, in order to to understand how Netflix uh, were doing uh, this type of business, they were um, replicated in uh, one um, city in in the US, and they replicated, and they actually at the end uh, decided that this is not going to 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 be a success, and they discarded. So. Not only they have uh, pride in myopia, they couldn't understand the new way of uh, doing things, and uh, they, they, you, you know the story. They uh, at the end they get uh, they got bankrupt. Distance from uh, from custom from, from customers, difficult to to devote decision making, and of course uh, the silos, which uh, I I was reading somewhere that we have the, this tribal thinking. Tribal thinking means we are thinking uh, close to to, to our um, colleagues, to our friends, and we cannot uh, easily collaborate. And it's very difficult to, to break this uh, tribal um, uh, thinking. Ways to, to be agile, of course, uh, feeling safe, one of the most important uh, thing that uh, psychological uh, safety makes people express themselves and this is the only way that uh, you can have uh, ideas you can understand what is happening and uh, take uh, the necessary action learning by all means you have to to to, to continue learning Another interesting point is that you have to, 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 to experiment. If you know in advance what is going to work uh, for you, it's not an experiment. You cannot uh, invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure, as uh, Donis uh, said in the beginning. Uh, fail fast. Of course, for big uh, companies, you don't want to fail, but to, to make small experiments in order to understand what is working uh, well and what it's working uh, and, it, and what it doesn't work. The outside in view is uh, the one that uh, I was describing to you before uh, with blockbuster case that they cannot understand what uh, the customer uh, wanted. It's very difficult and easy at the same time to, to understand what your customer uh, want. The customer didn't want to go in the, in the DVD stores, wait for uh, 30 minutes, and sometimes the DVD that they wanted to, to rent wasn't available, available. it had to, 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 to be in a waiting uh, list. This is something that uh, they couldn't understand, and of course, at the end, they, they went um, bankrupt. Disrupting uh, thinking is not uh, is is difficult. You know, we have uh, Uber uh, Eats that uh, that uh, created uh, some uh, autonomous uh, vehicle for uh, for delivering uh, food. They have created uh, a cloud. Uh, they have created uh, virtual uh, restaurants. To, for delivering uh, food, they have uh, created new model of of, um, of charging based on uh, distance and uh, the amount. Very, very in uh, disruptive uh, thinking. Prioritization is also very important in uh, in uh, the agile uh, business uh, mindset. Apple is one of the most successful company which prioritize when they launched the iPod the the iPhone they stopped the the iPod because they thought that you don't need an iPod anymore 
very difficult decision, but this is how you prioritize ruthlessly, very, very uh, important. And also, uh, most recently, they were examining to, to produce an electric uh, car. They understood that uh, they cannot excel on this. They could not uh, fight Tesla, and they reject uh, and they scrap the whole uh, program. Break the silos. I told uh, you about uh, this. is very, very difficult, but also very, very important. Agile decision making. The best paradigm of agile is uh, Zara. They ordering and receiving the uh, products uh, inside the stores several uh, times uh, every week. They are ordering based on uh, what uh, the local customers are buying, and they are the branch managers are trained to exercise uh, good judgments. It's very very important. And don't ever forget that safety is before uh, agility. The case of, uh, of Boeing with the uh, MAX 737 is a very interesting uh, example. Uh, and at the end, the company, the uh, Boeing, decided that uh, the uh, pilots didn't uh, need uh, training in the new systems because formal training is very expensive for um, thousands of uh, pilots in the, in the companies, and we all know the very I'm uh, going to be a little faster now, but uh, in order, uh, what is needed to, in order to execute uh, your priorities by empowering your people? How to engage people on the agile journey? I would like to say one only and one uh, thing only is the vision, is the mission, is the purpose. In order to be agile, you have to know where you want to to go. You have to to feel safe, but also to to know what is the priority of the company and uh, for your department. And uh, this is the, the the biggest thing. All the other are the necessary uh, conditions, but the biggest thing is to know where. To go, and in order to to do this, you have to articulate the vision, meaning be very very specific on what you want to to do. And uh, now that uh, we talk a bit a little bit about uh, business agility, I would like to to think all of you what uh, you did personally in your daily hab habits in order to prove that uh, you become agile or what you want to do from now on in order to become agile, what you change in your daily habits and uh, what it uh, hinders you in order to become more agile and especially more open to, to change and more open to challenges. And uh, my final word is what will you change after today? in uh, in uh, your daily habits and in uh, mainly in your uh, thinking and uh, mindset thank you very much and i'm open to to question great thank you a lot mr zantopoulos so now for um I'd like to ask the audience whatever question you might have you can either raise your hand or you can write it on the chat um and I can start with some questions that uh, I got from your presentations, if that's, that's OK. So I would, I would assume that one of the questions that uh, the audience would have is that lean startup and agile methodologies are kind of similar, right? They're talking about having some sprints, being fast, changing, pivoting. What would you say that is the difference between them? Is there a difference? Is there something that you should follow? Is there a way to follow both of them? Should I answer, Costadinia? Uh, would you like? Should no, I start? No, no, no. I don't see. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I would say there are uh, two different uh, views of the same coin. So, mm. so lead startup is actually very specifically applied for startups, 
and this methodology later can also be used also to bigger companies but this is also you know innovation new product development in, entering new markets while uh, while what uh, the previous uh, presenter presented is actually a, a culture a way of doing things in general mm. so less specific and it and it actually has to do with all the operations, even of a very big company like Zara, he explained, of, uh, of how we're doing our logistics, which is not necessarily, not necessarily, eventually there is also innovation in, in, in that part. Okay. Yeah, and, and, oh, and yeah, sorry. If, if, no, 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 if, if I, I, I can add is the, 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 the startup uh, thinking should be certainly in place of big uh, uh, corporation but uh, in smaller uh, scale this is the difference you have to 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 make possible to be innovative in smaller uh, risk in smaller uh, cases and then if something is successful leverage it very very fast can I add also something on this discussion? Uh, let me and and this this shift I I very much agree and we can see it also. I, I'll give you an example. Fifteen years ago, if somebody was had a startup and it failed, this is and then he later uh, applied for a job at a, at a at a big multinational company. This was something like a like a total shift in 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 what he's doing, and it sounded very old for an HR department. Right now, HR departments of big multinational companies are searching for people with a startup experience in order to integrate them in their teams. So in order to have all this culture, all these methodologies and all these uh, all these um, tools that are used also in startups, the startup, startup mind culture. OK. And another word that people hear a lot, I think it's like a buzzword lately, is the Scrum. What is a Scrum Master? How you can use Scrum? If that's part of Agile methodologies, if that's a different thing, would you like to also maybe answer to that? Well, I'll go first, shall I? Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 okay, Scrum is actually all this started because we we started changing the way we're writing code and at the, at the beginning it was i need to have all all the things prescribed in a very big document and then we're starting writing code and then we're entering into what we call the agile methodologies and and scrum where you actually experimenting before having all the features of the software this is actually the the main idea also behind Lean Startup was people that had the experience of agile methodology on how we write in code and transferred this experience on how we start a, a, a startup. A, a, and then this becomes a more general culture and a more general way of doing things. OK. And um... Something that uh, Mr. Liberatos, you had it in, in your in your presentation. You said that you're not going to go very deep into the team part, but I think it's very important, especially because our audience is mostly um, comprised of uh, startuppers. And I think that most of us already know that the team is one of the most important factors, right? Investors do not only invest into product, but mainly they invest in, into teams. Is there something that you would like to point out that is very important for a team to have you said that they need to work together well to have balance is there anything else that you think is important yeah a few things i fully agree with you the earlier we are the team is more important uh, because you don't have a if you have a company of of 300 people then you have processes you have a brand name you have clients you have suppliers so you have many things i'm not saying that the team is not important for a company of 300 people but if you don't have anything just a vision that i would like to develop something that looks like that the team is is 100 percent important uh, if i could add one thing is the complementarity among the, the members of the team 
So you need at least one pay a person who is the, the maker and a person who is the seller. So let's say a people, uh, someone um, cooking and someone selling food, someone writing code and someone selling software. It's important to somehow try to find a balance between uh, between the two. Okay. And most of most of most of the times in the beginning, you forget the, the sellers. You have mainly makers, and this is this is natural that the makers are making things. And in order to accept the sellers and the roles of of the sellers, is very important for the scaling of uh, of the company. Yes. Okay. It is. And this does not necessarily mean eventually I've seen people transformed from makers to sellers and they were very good sellers or business developers or uh, name them as you like because they also knew the product very well. But someone has to accept the role of I'm going out, I'm talking to people, I'm, 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 I'm talking about our products, services, etc. Okay, so would you say that uh, if a startup, let's just focus on startups for now, if a startup is lean or follows agile methodologies, would you say that it, it can become more competitive compared to other startups only because it has more lean, more of a lean thinking? I would say they, they could fail earlier and they have eventually the time, uh, the money uh, and the courage to start again or to change their pathway because if you don't follow lean eventually you fail very far very very late and then you're exhausted and then you don't have any money you you, the, you run out of uh, team members and, and and you cannot really get back in track yeah, i think that's very important to point out for everyone watching that when you have a startup uh, you will have some sunk costs right no matter what and you need to just, if you see that something doesn't work, change it, find another way, talk to your audience, as you said, or your customers, sorry, in the market, see what they need and what is the problem and actually try to solve that other than just the vision that you have in mind that would, like a problem that would potentially exist, right? And be prepared also to change your vision. I have seen very, very ambitious person to, after a while, they saw that their ambition cannot be feel, uh, fulfilled, and then, but they gained a, a, what we call a lifestyle business, which is fine. It's and then I've seen people having a normal business and then being very creative. Uh, suddenly, after a few years' time, they 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 actually integrated some innovation on what they did and they exploded. So there's one not one way of, of doing things. Okay, and um, one more question that I have is: Are there any drawbacks on these methodologies? Like we are, we are saying that it's something that might be very useful for the startups. Uh, they're gonna fail. They're gonna fail fast. They're gonna learn from that. What are the drawbacks of uh, following this type of thinking? I, I can say there is no drawback. It's difficult. Okay. So it's it's mainly difficult to just uh, implement it, but it's not that you are going to lose out on something else. It's it's difficult to to collaborate. It's difficult to to have an open mindset. It's difficult to 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 to, to think outside the, the the box. It's not for everyone. This is why it's it's difficult. But of course, it's interesting. It's fun. It's. Um, it's vivid, it's a die, so. It's uh, let, let, let me give you an example, and I fully agree what, mm -hmm. with what you're saying. There are some cases where lead startup cannot be really applied. I mean, if you want to open a small shop on the central square of your small hometown, this is not necessarily a lead startup that would lead you there. Or eventually in some deep tech cases, it, it it's not necessarily uh, very easy to, to apply some of the methodologies, but in general, let me give you an example. I have a, I have a class in at the university, and they're actually doing lean startup, and they're working on the business idea. And I had a team working on a business idea in relation to tourism, and they wanted to verify the problem, so they had to ask tourists. 
So I, I had a girl who uh, went to Acropolis. She was sitting on a bench. Half of the bench was on the shade and half the bench was in the sun. And she sat on the sun because as tourists came down, they, they were looking for shade and they were just sitting next to her. And you're sitting next to her, you're somehow exhausted because you are two, two and a half hours in Acropolis. You're sitting on the shade in a bench and next to you sits 22-year-old 20 year girls who starts conversating with you. Where are you from? What are you doing? How did you do that? Did you have a tourist guide? How was it? And then she had all the answers. Just because she went to Acropolis and she was sitting on the part of the bench that was on, in the sun. So you need this type of, 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 of mentality. You need this type of, of, of creative thinking uh, in order to do a uh, lead startup. And I agree, this is not for everyone. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for all your responses. Um, the only question that we had so far is that if uh, we can share your presentations afterwards, if that's okay with both of you. Yeah, uh, that's great. Do we have any questions from, from the people watching? Oh, we have one raised hand, but then it was lowered again. I missed it. Is there any questions or no? So it hadn't been raised, but now it's not anymore. Either way, if we don't have any questions, you can, of course, just um, contact us directly and then we can send it to our speakers and whenever they have the time, they can uh, they can get back to you. Uh, and I would like to thank a lot both Mr. Zanatopoulos and Mr. Livieratos. It has been extremely useful and very valuable for, for our members. Thank you a lot for joining today and for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you. I'm going to share on the chat the link of Inaugura, so anyone that hasn't joined yet, please go and create your profile because it can be very useful, as you saw from our webinar. And uh, we're looking forward to more events in the future. Thank you, everyone, a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.